Hello, Internet. Welcome to another Wednesday's Serial. I'm just going to run through some comics and talk about my thoughts. <laughs> All right, let's do this. First up is Amazing 26. You've heard about this. This is the one where Miss Marvel bites it. Um, I don't know how to put it. I wrote in um, this was offensive, frankly, like this is textbook bad like i can point again to things that you learn in creative writing that they aren't meeting here as far as how to just construct a story about how to make things matter about why anybody would care about character why the plot is moving at a pace and in ways that don't engage people like like there aren't necessarily rules in writing but there are proven things that work and proven things that don't work especially most of the time sometimes you can break some of those rules because you've established other things or there's something about your story that makes something work where it wouldn't work for other stories which is usually interesting people usually point to that like this feels weird but like it, it's working here it doesn't feel like it should but it does you'll hear that kind of stuff when people are talking about movies comics video games whatever um no, not here. Um, there's a reason why everybody is reacting really negative at this point to what's going on at Amazing. It is just terrible. Now, I have heard a bit more mixed reviews about 27, 28, because this is just goofy comics. Um, it's about J. Jonah Jameson's relationship to Doc Ock's old tentacles that help save Spider-Man's life once in a moment of hesitation against Doc Ock, and now Doc Ock has new tentacles, which... I don't know. They're going the old tentacles to, like, a dog now. I. It's goofy. It's catching some people. It's not catching a lot of people. Um, it certainly didn't catch me. At this point, it's actually been interesting, because I did get into something of a talk with people online about this where they're saying a lot of what i've said to other people and rightfully so like you're not enjoying this clearly like stop buying it and a lot of what they're saying is if everybody who wasn't enjoying amazing would stop buying it it would send a message now there's a lot to be said of proving that the sales for amazing aren't great but that the sales are good it's weird so the sales that the shops are doing that marvel is getting are remain decent because it's amazing spider-man there's incentives and there's variant covers and people buy it because amazing spider-man much like batman monthly is just industry standard and i'm locked in with some of that because i don't want to break my amazing run at this point i just don't i've invested too much i care too much even if i don't like the comic i like to know i don't like the comic where and when every month like it's part of the conversation it's just it's a book I buy habitually and will always more so than pretty much any other book except for Turtles Monthly and certain other things. You know, um, but very rarely does a book have that level of cachet. Um, but because of that, it's a different equation. It's really hard to put that down, whereas it's a lot easier to put down some Spider-Man side stuff because I know I can pick it up secondhand later for probably cheaper that's the way i'm buying books that's hard math um i don't know it's just a weird point or to just go through it. and that's why i wanted to blitz through that um i don't like the book i think it's garbage i would highly recommend if you're curious pirate it i there's no other way to get around at this point just don't pay for this if you can avoid it i feel like i should be i'm not that's my fault there you go meanwhile though it's frustrating. Spider-Man by Slot, I think, is a better book. It's competent, but it's hitting a lot of the same problems I'm having with Spider-Man overall at this point. A lot of people are pointing to the fact that the marriage has become a hot issue again between MJ and Peter and their relationship. That whole thing is a problem, partially because it's poorly written. What they did to MJ is sexism in narrative and whatnot. Like, point blank, also the enemy calling her the Scarlet Woman isn't helping anything um <laughs> uh but dan slots leaning on the part that's bugging me more and that's this buddy buddy relationship between norman osborne and peter parker i can't it, it never was sold to me it, it's based on the premise that 
Norman Osborn was shot with a shotgun and his sins were absolved, I guess. Um, not absolved, but out of him? I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. That's part of the problem. The character didn't earn any absolution. That's another problem. It's the idea of this villain redemption arc, which I've seen done, done better, done to death, and then done again. And with Norman Osborn, it just doesn't work. Um, also, it, even that not working of itself is one thing. Peter working with him is another. Norman Osborn killed his girlfriend. Sure, I don't think that would be the biggest thing, though. Norman Osborn killed his newborns before Peter even saw them. Honestly, at that point, I've thought about this a number of times. Spider-Man doesn't kill. But the problem with a lot of superheroes is there's that one villain where, like, they really probably should kill, like, that one person. Because the moral argument, like, for or against killing all that, like gets really weirdly weighted against one person in spider-man's case there's like two or three though um carnage arguably should be killed because th just the math of that works out uh norman osborne peter parker should kill because he killed his newborn kids like I, there are court cases where something like that happens and they let someone go because the crime committed and, and the response to I, I just, it's like, what are you going to do? Throw someone in jail for responding to someone murdering their children? That's, I mean, defense, but also just like, I, there's a moral understanding and code that, that was broken there. And when Marvel did that, um, to come back now and do this, it just, in no way was it earned. In no way, Norman has never addressed the children. Either, by the way, Gwen, sure. Some of the other things, sure. Never the children. And that's the part that gets me the most. Is he, I, he killed newborns. Uh, I don't know. Um, okay. So there's all that. Um, something caught me that I didn't think I was going to enjoy as much, as, but I did, was this um, Ninja Turtle Saturday Morning Cartoon Take 2 series they're doing. They had a few issues. This one is taking concept and playing it out over a few issues and kind of building more of like in um you know a tv arc a plot b plot and doing some stuff but the a plot has been the rat king can now command the turtles instead of splinter and splinter's trying to deal with it and it's i don't know it was really dynamic the humor just landed like i don't know it's just been real good um it's a lot better than what it was last time so if you're on the fence about that one i can't imagine too many people are they're probably in or out um Turtles 140 is finally coming out of the Armageddon game, and we are moving forward based on a lot of what happened. Obviously, there's no way to avoid that. It's a post-event comic in a single-stream series. Uh, I, it was good. They did slow down, but they're not slowing down to the effect that they did right before the Armageddon game with Sophie Campbell's like building of character uh, through Mutant Town, which... This issue, in a way, to me, was so strong because it's showing a lot of the characterization and ideas that were built through that kind of down years worth of comic um, are actually now we're coming out on the other end of it. And those relationships, those characters that are built, whatnot, it's going somewhere. Um, it doesn't make those comics good, but it does make them more meaningful and so going back, if you were to read it again, I think, A, with the fact you're not waiting month to month and in that moment, it should move right by. They should be pretty quick reads. Um, but also that amount of emotion carrying into stuff with more drama and action, then, you know, that respite will lead to more. And there is too much of it there. there. There's no question. But we're moving forward and now we're making more meaning of it. And so... It'll carry forward, and I think the series will bear the weight of a weaker moment a lot better. So that's really impressive. It also really speaks to um, a lot that Waltz did. The, the, Waltz isn't even really on this issue, but you can feel his through line of everything that had happened through the Armageddon game just being played out here. Um, there's no way that couldn't have happened, no matter who was on the book, but I, I think it's... in. A stronger creative place than it was before the event so 
really hopeful for the next stretch of Turtles and kind of curious to see where it goes. IDW, I know, is in kind of dire straits. And Turtles is, if not the, definitely one of their strongest books. And if the, and if IDW folds, um, I'm kind of curious to see if this book ends and then Turtles gets reincarnated somewhere else, because that would happen inevitably. Or if this iteration of the Turtles continues from here to another publisher and that has that in that way has never carried through before with the turtles usually when there's a new line at a new publisher it's a new iteration and that's part of the reason i think turtles has endured in a way stronger than some of the marvel and dc stuff from a conceptual standpoint is just that there's a core of what makes the turtles the turtles but you don't have to justify an ultimate universe or not. It's just a new take. And can you imagine if we had that every decade or so with Spider-Man, Batman, whatever? Like, yeah, I mean, you get what it's about and they get to redo the origin story in a way that's meaningful. And then it carries forward. I, I don't know. I mean, for all the crises DC's doing, they never just do that. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so... Also, um, Turtles Usagi 4, um, I'm going to note here, I'm just going to go on it. Um, I spent a long time this month looking into Usagi and what it would take to buy a collection to read through the at least majority of Usagi. There's going to be a handful of uh, short stories and asides that it looks like I'd have to really plunder to read. Um, unsurprisingly, I guess, Turtle crossovers and trades with that um, are very expensive. Annoyingly, the Mirage run of Usagi, which led to a lot of these crossovers and whatnot, were in color and beautiful color um, with some luminaries from uh, Steve Olaf's time as he was inventing digital color separation, doing it accurately, like out the gate with Akira and then moving on. Um, after that, he had some people and he had this company and people learned and, and moved forward. Um, Mirage had some of those people and you saw some of that or they just had hand coloring at Mirage depending on the time and uh and I'm sorry I might be confusing some of the turtle stuff I'm thinking with the digital separation might be the first publishing not the Mirage coloring sorry it's coming to understand it was the Mirage books colored anyways um so Usagi basically doesn't do color. There's the IDW collections, which I found out aren't just the early, like it's some of the early stuff remixed and presented in different orders and whatnot, da, 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 but it's really fun and then it's in color. Um, I was enjoying those. I'm just going to have to go to the black and white collections of stuff and enjoy that, but knowing especially the Mirage Turtles stuff in particular was colored makes it even harder to go to the black and white. Um, but I'm going to be getting that and reading through a lot of that. Looking forward to that, especially after reading so much goddamn Punisher. Uh, yeah. So, I don't know. This has taken on a new meaning. What's interesting to me, and I've said this before, this Turtles Usagi crossover feels like the Usagi-owned crossover, where before they either tried to meet more in the middle or is more a uh, Turtles story. This is more the other way. And it's somewhat frustrating because they've done some similar things before, especially during the Mirage era, where the turtles just come into Usagi's world and they fit right in, basically. But they are still a bit fish out of water just because of their personalities, which is an interesting thing for a big comic book crossover thing. It just has a different light and air to it where it really works. And you really see the separation of the characters immediately. And there's a moment here where Raphael acts like Raphael, but because they're in you know, this highly uh, martial arts kind of thing, his attitude is immediately checked by the people around him. And they have a bit about like how what he did was disrespectful. He immediately apologizes and does that. The turtle, the other turtles don't have to intervene at all. It's because they are ninjas. They are with that martial understanding that they kind of toe in line really quickly once they kind of get their feet wet. And it's just, it works so good. And I wish it could actually be extended a bit more because you almost have to do that initial blush of reintroducing the characters every time. 
so you lose an issue and I, I i'd rather see them interact with more of the world and be in some of the softer stories and not have to be in the big crossover justification big thing smaller stakes smaller stories keep saying it keep meaning it um then there's a uh, turtles versus street fighters just kind of a fun book i'm playing street fighter i'm reading turtles no way i was gonna get this anyways i'm beginning the turtles stranger uh was it stranger things crossover and i don't know anything about stranger things so yeah. um and then last ronin the lost years i'm finding this book far more compelling than the lost ronin regular i guess story was because this is going more into the weird world and some of the dystopian stuff and really playing with some of the idea and actually has this grumpy michelangelo uh with kind of a death wish interacting with some different things it feels very much like a wolverine book in a lot of ways um i don't know it's been interesting it plays at different things and i'm going to be really interested to see how they ultimately try to collect some of this stuff because really the, this story is informing so much about the last run and later um, that I'm wondering if they're going to try to weave it all together. Uh, next up, I got some facsimiles. Um, 121, 122. I actually have a 121. I uh, don't have a 122 because as you might imagine, they're pricey. Uh, so I have these. Um, it's been really funny to reread these, though, in light of more recent Amazing Spider-Man and kind of realize, like, so much of what we talk about with, you know, what fans want and whatnot. Like, this upset people at the time, and kind of rightfully so. And so you see some of that negative fan reaction. There's a reason why so much negative fan reaction with comics is eff effectively dismissed. Um, people react strongly when they feel strongly about something and ultimately that's kind of something the readers or the readers the writers want the creators want you know strong emotion they care about the characters and something bad they might react poorly to the people who made that happen as it were uh and that's a lot of comic fandom and just dismissing that and there is a certain portion of that happening with like the zeb wells amazing spider-man situation as well there's no denying that um it's hard though because so many are focused on the marriage and the relationship and how that is and marvel editorial i mean in writing in practice in continuation just has this thing where uh, if we let them be married and be happy the story is over or something which is insane on so many levels like married characters can create good dynamics and interesting things to move forward um you know i that that's not the end of the story we did it for years and it worked and a lot of that is some of the most beloved spider-man of all time so no like just it, it, there's such a direct thing and there's so many ancillary you know lois and clark or the fantastic four or whatever like obviously no um but it, they just kind of keep pushing this and it, it's like these two bumpers of insanity going at each other but now there's this elevation of the poor writing the dynamic with norman that's just hard to ignore and now the fridging of kamala and it just keeps going it's like no you guys need to reset you need to get a new editor someone who has some sensibility and sanity to come with fresh eyes and you have to get a new writer um it, it, and I, I think it sucks. I know for a fact Zeb Wells can write a good comic. I know for a fact Zeb Wells can write a good Spider-Man comic. But right now, that amazing Spider-Man seat is a little too hot, and they need to tell some smaller stories and just get the book back on the right path. We've seen it with every major comic book at some point. Things just go haywire, and they need to bring it back to basics or reset or just do whatever, you know, they all, whatever the buzzword is this month. But amazing spider-man is that book right now it needs to reset it just needs a couple issues of spider-man punching rhino in the face taking out the shocker you just some of that just get a decent status quo back and move forward just gotta and the problem is is they've ruined too many of the toys lately they they, they ruined the osborne thing they ruined the j jonah jameson thing uh they, they're ruining the mary jane thing 
a lot of the other side characters haven't really been used in any major way for so long now that they they've they lack the credibility and you'd have to reintroduce them again and so they really need to bring it back to a place where an understanding that the side cast makes the book especially in the soap drama and it just hasn't been there um Speaking of, Red Goblin playing with Normie Osborne and the whole Carnage thing. Frankly kind of pointless. Miles Morales being sucked into this so early after kind of a disappointing start to a new creative team isn't helping. I'm hoping that they kind of come out the other end and are able to have a win. Um, Spider-Man India is a weird book written in the sense of the Spider-Verse and justifying an Indian Spider-Man in that sense um, rather than telling a good story with this character that was kind of needed. Um, and a lot of it is just taking famous Spider-Man villains and putting indian gods or some indian cultural thing to it in the most hackney way it's hard because this is done by indian creators intentionally but if this exact same issue was written by white people it would be declared racist there's just no toys around it it's it's a hack book um spider-man 2099 this new spider-man 2099 rash has just been bad um doctor strange 3 is moving forward I, I found out it's not really my thing but it's this weird doctor strange being dismissive of dormammu and just talking about how many times he's defeated him to make him feel bad to save this one guy he's possessed it's a weird one-off issue really um i don't know edge of spider verse 2 and 3 they bring back this musical spider lady thing it just i've seen it done a few times this idea of a musical and a comic book doesn't land because a musical needs i know this is crazy to say uh music so yeah. um and then this issue with spider smasher uh, kind of a miles morales femme take um decent issue kind of more of what i'd want from a spider-verse thing but i think this whole spider-verse thing has been done to death over the last several years so i hope they just put it in the ground uh silk feels very much like that it's versions of silk this time in a western uh i don't know it's been a book um moving companies uh green arrow we're kind of getting the cast into this weird nether space where Ollie was locked. Um, this doesn't feel like a Green Arrow book at all. It's not streetwise. It's playing with the DC metaverse next. We're dealing with Parallax Hal. Um, I don't know. Uh, Green Lantern continues, and this has been a fun issue with Hal kind of finding his mojo again with Kilowog's help, but the stance of the Green Lanterns and whatnot feels very in flux. It feels very tied to continuity strings for a number two issue. Um, I just kind of want us to move forward. Too much of this book is like on between Hal and Carol because they're fated to be together, right? And is Carol the wrong name? Sorry. Uh, Ferris. Um, and just let it go. If you guys want to have new relationships, that's fine. It's kind of the Mary Jane thing. If they want her, them to be with someone else, fine. But just go be with someone else. Don't get caught up in this whole faded idea. Um, Power Girl special came out. This was a trip. I kind of lost it with all the alternate reality and lack of background stuff. Um, it's not really a special. It's a first issue leading into her new series uh i'm not following and then superman 5 this is this is the best dc book going right now um absolutely great fun jimmy olsen kind of a side thing here playing into just becoming another 
layer of fabric in this building of a kind of new take on Superman that's very based in the old, um, ending with Lex Luthor asking for Superman to save him. I love this issue. I think this whole run's been excellent. Um, Wildcats continues. Uh, I don't know if I have too much to say. A lot of unwanted violence. Uh, it's been fun, but I don't know if I'd recommend it to anyone right now. Uh, clobbering time. This is kind of Marvel two and one redone with Stoke. Uh, excellent. I mean, just get this for the art alone. But this issue with Doom was real fun. And I mean, this is not a book to be taken seriously. This is a book to savor and just enjoy all the comic goofiness. Like this is just great, and the art is just. Like I said, just worth it on its own right there. Um, Zadarsky, Daredevil 12. I'm not even going to pause to gather my thoughts on this one. It is Zadarsky's every pretentious thought he's ever had is coming to bear in this book. And now Elektra and Daredevil fight to the death so that he can end in hell to fight the beast. I can't, I can't. But it's a symbolic death for a rebirth of Daredevil. Um, it's too pretentious to take seriously. It's, yeah, I mean, like, we'll get there so I can compare it to the Punisher, but I mean, a lot of people point to the Punisher ending being weak, and it is, but for all the same reasons, this Daredevil run is weak and terrible and pretentious and missing the point of the character. And we even haven't had a law thing whatever there's not really talk of justice anymore it's just religion and oh is it painful meanwhile there's this other book um daredevil and echo that's like a real daredevil comic that's been really fun and great and a breath of fresh air i i I wish they had more comics like that that are good good's the wrong word because what's good what's bad but like doing what we signed up for when we buy the book i guess um here it is. Aaron's Punisher is this is the second time Aaron has ended Punisher, and it is it misses the point. Um, ultimately, this book is trying to say that killing is wrong and killing is bad. But when you're dealing with the people the Punisher kills, the moral calculus should become more complicated. And I'm not saying that it should in a real world sense. I'm saying it should for the sake of storytelling, because if you're trying to say something this basic with this and ending here. It really makes things so simple. There's no point in saying it in the first place. Uh, And also this idea that Maria was going to divorce Frank is stupid. And also he ends in hell to fight again. I'm guessing that's going to tie into the Daredevil thing. But... um... (sighs) Not for nothing. Canonically, Frank's been to hell already. He was kicked out. He, canonically, this book doesn't make sense anyways. Who cares? Uh, it's It misses the point of the Punisher from however you view the character. It, it, it doesn't work. And anytime they try to do something highly supernatural with Frank, it doesn't really work. Frank Castle's kind of the exception of that. Partly because Frank and Castle knew it didn't quite work, and he was playing with that uncomfortable idea and the idea of what's a monster and whatnot. And so, it because it knew it had an end cap and it moved to it, uh, that kind of worked. Anyways, um, okay, click, click, boom. A weird kind of crime comic with some quirky twists i i don't know where this is going yet actually but um i'll see where it does uh pandora chapter one ends out and i think i'm done with this this became something kind of cool and different to very much becoming a lot of the worst instincts of frank miller being brought forward um bishop Ward college finished out and this last issue really undercut the rest of the series yeah oh before i continue so the idea being that uh, 
our bishop, not the other world bishop, is uh, carries violence with him and whatnot, and then it ends with like this training exercise. But bishops give him a little bit of hope, and he's less of a hard ass at the end. I, uh, it's not really character growth for a guy who committed genocide and got the person he committed. He committed genocide to try to kill hope. I guess I should say. Um, so this idea that he's a hard ass is the lighter version of him already. The fact that Hope forgave him in any sense or meaning is still weird to me. Um, and to have him be a slightly softer drill sergeant that allows for emotion and growth or something, just for everything they did in the series of the idea of this black-led X-Men world being relatively peaceful, things being good necessarily and talking about how directing their energies to build and grow rather than deal with defense and destruction by being less militaristic they were softer to a threat but they were building a better world for anyone was this really interesting idea and to just undercut that with the ending of oh he needs to teach some teams to fight good it, it, it just undercuts the entire mini and everything they were doing and the Afrofuturism idea, all of it is just completely undercut. Um, okay. Completely switching gears, hold on. Uh, Deadpool 7 and 8. Um, fun hijinks comic uh, with Daredevil's new bow. Um, it's interesting, there's a point here too to the idea of uh, Deadpool's supposed pansexuality, which is a farce. Uh, he's willing to make jokes, but he's never had any true romantic interest in anything but a relatively attractive hot straight woman, with the possible exception being when he dated, or when he married, was it Shalaka or whatever, in the Dugan run? Because she's a demon, but I mean, <laughs> stacked. Uh, I don't know. This doesn't, doesn't play through. But... That aside, fun book. This is an idea of them being like a quirky little family with like a kid dog or whatever. And that's a Venom thing. And it's just a lot of fun stuff. But again, wouldn't necessarily recommend it to anyone. Wouldn't turn anyone off it either. This is the best Deadpool's been in years, which for being a lukewarm fun book is maybe kind of sad for the character overall, but it's good that they're at least at that level of pace. But it is nothing to the heights of where the character has ever been. But it is a nice palate cleanser in the pile. Um, the best book Marvel's putting out right now, Fantastic Four, had another great issue. What a shock. Um, dealing with this mystery menace and them being kind of solving mysteries on the farm. Maybe a bit of a Scooby-Doo vibe. Uh, and again, this play with memory. Um, that, that's been kind of a theme throughout. That they're trying to solve things, but they don't remember things correctly. Um I think it's good, but I feel like if we get this one isn't quite wrapped up, but if we get another one of those kinds of things after this, that might wear a little thin, but time will tell. I, I, that being said, I thoroughly enjoyed this issue. Highly recommend anyone catching up and picking up Fantastic Four. It's just one issue a month and it is, again, best thing Marvel's publishing. Certainly better than anything, better than most anything you're picking up. I'm, I'm sure it's been excellent well worth the read uh next is ultimate invasion this is a lot of place setting to get somewhere to talk about rebooting the ultimate books it's very much a hickman book uh with the diagrams and the needless dialogue and whatnot but to its credit i mean it's this big thick issue and they are taking their time with a handful of characters to set uh, where they're going with it they set why miles isn't really going to be a part of this new universe though i have a feeling he might be a bigger part of this book for a while um i don't know it's it's interesting but i, I have a feeling they're trying to make it out to be something bigger than it ever really can be because it's just ultimately kind of a place setter to a publishing need um, Saga 65, we're blasting off to a new chapter of Saga, thank God, because the last one was more than a little dreary and put a lot of people off, and with some good reason. 
it was needlessly droll. But um, I, I think some of the adventure, some of the excitement, and some of the sci-fi is really going to snap into gear once we're past this. And I think, much like what I was saying with Turtles, Saga will probably be better for having taken that moment to do some of its messaging and talking about the lower tiers of the worlds that they're talking about as they do this higher bit so that they can come back to some reality and have that heightened reality as well and really play it through. Um, I think the series will be stronger for it in the long run, but right now it's a little hard to grunt through that in the moment, month to month. Um... <laughs> I bought this. Uh, Deadpool Better Blood is a Liefeld comic that I bought with my money. And I'm just saying that to publicly shame myself. I guess I'm going to get the rest of them. It's so bad. Um, okay. New Mutants Lethal Legion is wrapping up this mini. Yeah, not quite. Uh, next issue will. It's... <laughs> Moving forward, it's playing with some X-Men to Marvel Universe stuff, and it's there. It's not poorly done, it's just not grabbing me. Um, X twenty. There's this X-23 mini, which is kind of set to earlier years with the character, building up stuff that it's harder to access because the comics it's trying to play off of are ones that are impossibly expensive to go read. Um, yeah. The Excellent is moving to kind of an end with kind of all their unlikable characters. Frankly, I hope this is the end for this new era of kind of the ecstatics thing. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't been loving it. Ready for that to be off the table and let the talents there move on. To, like, I understand these characters and these ideas help build up their careers. Um, it was a different moment in comics. I think those comics are actually stronger than this return to them. So, yeah. Um, the Ugly Pedestrian Life of Christopher Chaos is a pretty stock standard uh, teenage, odd teenager story that's very prevalent through comics and superhero stuff in particular. This is taking the mad scientist route. There's a couple fun moments in here. They're really trying to sell them on the fact this character is gay which is good at least like that is a thing and it is the main character and is actually a part of the story um but i don't know uh it, it's pretty stock standard though this is only the first issue kind of setting it up origins being, being a long tail origin this is the kind of book i buck against i like the ultimate spider-man but that first volume it's a long read to get to Peter Parker got spider powers, and also it was because of an Oscorp exper experiment. That should have been an issue, not six. Um, that's kind of what I'm feeling here. Like, I get it. He's this odd, kooky kid who does experiments and stuff. The town doesn't like him. And they're using that as kind of an allegory to the gay thing where, like, they're kind of tolerating him, but he doesn't like him and his life's uncomfortable because a lot of that. I get it. Get to the story. <laughs> I don't need the allegory. I don't need this much police setting. We're smarter than this. You can put a couple things in the background, lampshade it, and move on. Like, yeah. we're smarter than this. We're more competent readers now. We can reread an issue if we need to. Like, let's go. Um, and that's what this book is suffering from. And it's hard to hate it too much because, A, unlike Spider Man, this is a the character this is a issue one and um there's a reason that they want to take more time with it because i'm imagining if you are a 13 year old gay kid uh you may want to swim in that mayu a little longer because it's going to be more for you and there isn't a lot of that out there so i'm trying to approach it with some sympathy but i mean from a story standpoint like yeah it's slow um I think the rest are X-Books. So um, Mortal X-Men is moving up to the fall of X through finding out um, Colossus is trapped in a Russian novel in a way that's being, like, his what he's saying is being written for him. He has a certain amount of control in the output, but that ends up just kind of twisting the knife more because it's a Russian novel, so of course it's tragic. It's kind of an old adage, but, like, 
like I get where they're coming from, but it's just so like it's so literally on the face of that. Like that is not like a character destiny him to that like it's like his mind is trapped under they didn't really explain it well it's a weird premise not well said and, and for one character in the middle of all this other nonsense with the x-men um yeah that didn't really land <laughs> uh yeah um gambit and rogue continue with kind of uh superhero hijinks for some standard couples therapy ideas being brought forward it's actually a fun idea for a book and if they were able to maybe play it a little more straight i actually think it might be a little stronger but it's definitely a fun read and worth checking out um, storm 2 is Nassetti playing with this kind of punk era of storm out a little bit more and it's funny this is storm but it really does play with the rest of the x cast from this moment of the books um it's fun x force continues um playing with their place setting but this issue in particular felt very constrained by the other books of Kirkoa at the moment and not really sure how to continue too much um dugan x-men continues to be dugan x-men um I, 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 what do i say here so they're fighting the sentinel who's really supposedly a big big iron man suit uh, forge does this thing that he thinks he's going to take the a out he literally there's literally a frame of him turning around giving this cheeky thumbs up and then he gets blasted and i couldn't help in that moment think like is that forge i don't because having read a lot of claremont's forge recently he was this more tortured character who inadvertently kind of created a mutant cure right and storm got caught up with it and it was this whole give and take and he was this guy who is this native american but rich guy dealing with kind of some of the guilt of that in the that alone and very isolated very not selfish necessarily in some ways selfish but in a more complicated way than like a petulant child but a, as an adult who is outcast by his talents um subset of society and abilities in a weird way that was far more complicated and interesting and now we just have this cheeky show off who's their tech guy who just spits stuff out um i don't know it just made me kind of realize like as much as i kind of love x-men and all that and a lot of these other marvel things going back and reading stuff from the 80s or the early 2000s whatnot there was more there in the book than is there currently it seems to be aimed towards people who aren't willing to read in a little more and it seems less connected to human emotion or anything but so caught up in marvel continuity that it's not really worried about these characters who they were the stories they tell or the weight of what they're bringing forward um i don't know it's just a really jarring moment for someone who's also i don't know realizing how friggin old they are reading some of this stuff it, it i don't know it really punched a hole for me so there's that um x-men red uh, this is the worst side of X-Men Red with, I think, Ewing playing into what Ewing does best, but is not best for this book. Uh, this was all the a Krakow Mars characters uh, bloviating about how hard their war-torn society is, which I really step back. This is issue 12. X-Men Red started essentially right after the terraforming so it's been running for a year i don't know how long it's supposed to be in continuity but normally marvel continuity of 12 issues is like a month or two right um and the characters in these books are talking about like these generations long war or whatever and it's like you you're infants i don't how 
like I know there's some like time capsule nonsense sci-fi BS or whatever, but like how am I supposed to care about these characters that are all just unlikable a-holes from war? Bloviating about war and what's wrong and what hurts and their their baby, their with your babies. I don't it and like they're it's the middle of all this other X-Men stuff going on. And the whole book is not about any X-Man character from whatever, but these humanoid alien people with fantasy swords and loincloths just going on at each other. It doesn't. I don't know who it's for. It's not for me. It's not that, like, again, it's not like it's a poorly done comic or anything per se, but the setup and the... The fact that it's an X-Men book and it's not an X-Men book, and normally I don't care about that if it's a good story, but this was not really... I mean, I just said it was well done, but it's not really a good story. It's a lot of people just bloviating at each other. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to be overly critical, per se. I'm sure there's someone who read it more diligently who got more out of it. I did skim over a lot of it because, again, I don't care. I just don't understand where we were supposed to enter caring or why we would even know about these characters and not deal with this weird age problem thing and like, I don't know. Yeah. Speaking of bloviating, the Heralds of Apocalypse. Uh, this is really a fight between Apocalypse and his wife. And by fight, I mean they're literally fighting with swords while they're talking. Uh, his wife being like, we're just soldiers, we're here to fight, and we need to prepare for the next fight, and oh my god, fighting, and oh my god, strength, and fight, and fight, and strength, and strength, fight. Just sounds real boring. Um, and Apocalypse here is not presented as Apocalypse, but as she calls him, her philosopher, uh, because he's saying strength is to survive, but we need to have more than strength now, and da da da, and to fight for a better future, and get a chance at peace, which is really weird for the guy who is the fascist allegory, and that's why he's created so that the strong might inherit the earth and they're trying to like take that axiom of what was said and try to make into something more grand and make this character seem more grand because he was part of the Krakoan era and a big part of it and they want to make him seem like a good guy but he's a fascist he's a literal fascist it's old point he was put in he's a bad bad man he's the bad blue man he's a fascist I don't know quite what else to say here uh so this rang really hollow um it was a lot of back and forth and this idea of strength and then they're gonna go their own way i guess they had a, a battle divorce or something i don't know if that counts i don't know if they care i don't know if i care i know i don't care um but apocalypse is off to go do something with his new stooge who was glad to have survived something despite getting stabbed in the head at the top of the comic by his wife because he didn't have a lot of brain matter there oh man what a great introduction to a character um yeah so i guess apocalypse is gonna come back and be part of the downfall of Krako. what a shock but they're not going to address any of the political reasons of why that's important or why it was kind of dangerous to do the story they did in the first place during the era of Trump. Cool. Um, yeah. So there's that. I hated it. Uh, <laughs> then there's the Mutant Massacre, which is the story that I really am confused why it wasn't like the second arc of the whole Krakoan era um but they finally did it uh, um, there's a town who was part of an attack that the x-men were involved with so a lot of mutants get blamed but then a lot of this issue is about the x-men offering aid and how to do it correctly from a philosophical standpoint so there's a lot of bloviating in here but good bloviating about like you know we're coming here we're offering care there's people who are coming in that are mutant hater the mutant hater group um, the watchdogs or something maybe i'm confusing with something else anyways um big bad mutant haters are coming in uh because supposedly the, mut the mutants caused the attack on this town but they're coming in they're offering aid they're saving lives they're offering food they're offering ways to keep people at ease and they're rebuilding the town there's going to be ongoing efforts 
yada yada. They're, they're talking about like a long term solution. All in one comic, though, so they don't ever have to deal with these people again in narrative. De- dear Lord, uh, that that would require like actual writing and care and time and the sort of thing that you do with a serialized story that makes it more interesting. Heaven forbid. No, we're not going to have like a full metal alchemist moment where we come in we're to a town that we saved holy nilly and then realize like there's long term effects to these sorts of things. No, 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 no. Nor are we going to do a DS9 where we're a station dealing with them. That is kind of the point of having a separate standalone thing no 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 no. we're just gonna address all an issue that's as much as we can get from x-men now uh with this global sense and in here there is a line if we are to be gods let's be benevolent ones which really hit home a lot of what i've been saying about oh our prayers the cute it's like well fuck you um (laughs) you immortal being with powers and get to live in eden like cares some people don't like you what a shock um um but they are offering care they're doing a lot of these right things um they have these red and white costumes that are supposed to be of care but the protesters are brought in to kind of create punching for the issue since it is superhero comic but they do talk about what they're doing with the town and then it ends on this end cap with orchis saying like Oh, well, we did. We set up this whole like false flag operation, whatever, for nothing because, you know, the means came in, they saved the day, everybody in the town likes them. And then the guy who masterminded the whole thing says basically, like, well, no, this was a sl- this was a win because at one point, um, Bishop of all characters is bloviating about peace and uh, about how we need to come in and not just help because we're not helping as a way to prove ourselves but we're helping as a way to be benevolent to uh the caregivers but in it he he says this line many people feel this was yet another act of immune aggression and they have the right to that belief trying to say like let people be people but we're, we're trying to show this and it goes on but they snip that quote and they're going to use it against them because the real weapon that they're using is optics and public persuasion which for a story told in <laughs> the trump era and whatnot is actually really meaningful um and, and speaks to a lot of what's happening in today's politics in a way that meets being the x-men and fun and whatnot um yeah yeah where was this comic years ago when all this shit started because they need to have this from the get-go but it's here now. It's a good issue. Would highly recommend picking it up. It's going to be uh, probably worth a little more than some of the others because it is actually important and important to the ongoing narrative in a way that the Apocalypse one won't be. Um, yeah. And then my last one, uh, Wolverine. We get this kind of moment between Beast and Wolverine where we're setting up for a big trade and we're going to get the final showdown of whatever this is going to be set up. Uh, it's fun, it's all right. But um, ultimately, the, the seed of what's going to happen was planted. Maybe Percy will pull out something to be a little wittier than this, but the idea is Beast has all these Wolverine clones. He also has kidnapped Wolverine's friend. And he's arranged for them to try to leave each other alone and be fine. But first there's going to be this trade between Wolverine's friend and then the two Wolverine clones that are feral that they captured. Because B says it takes a lot of time to produce one and whatever. Clearly he's trying to make a gesture more than equivalence. Um, the idea is, is those clones, their healing factor has snapped in and they're starting to be able to talk, which means soon their brains will be able to process thoughts and not just be delivered commands. So essentially there's an army of Wolverine clones that are going to snap and turn off beast. Uh, and he doesn't realize it yet is the idea. Um, sure. That's a way to end it out. The problem is, is the whole idea is that beast is supposed to be super intelligent. And why wouldn't he consider that as a possibility, at least watch for it. Um, and also if they're able to figure that out and notice that, wouldn't he immediately notice that as well once the signs start popping up? I don't know. It just... Okay. But I, I see where it's going. It seems like a decent way to push towards an end game, but it, it's not the most 
tactfully written idea. So there you be. Yeah, that was that was a pile of comics for the month. I did also get a couple other things, but I haven't read them yet. So cheers, keep reading, and I'm gonna try to be more positive about what I am reading. I swear.